Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. We hope you've enjoyed this series of lessons on the sanctuary. We're studying these lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for this is the third set of three months, the third quarter of 2013. And I'm sorry, it's the fourth quarter. <laughs> this is the lesson number seven in that series for November 16 of 2013. And uh, before We'll be looking at some, this lesson is entitled, Christ Our Sacrifice, and we'll be looking at some, a number of scriptures, so I hope you have your Bible handy. Before you um, open your Bible, though, let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father, we ask that your guidance will be with us as we take on some challenging portions of scripture. We hope that we may come to some mutual, uh, mutually understandable uh, explanations of what we see and, and talk about. And may those who join us in this conversation be blessed by what we say is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We know that the book of Hebrews describes Christ as both a sacrifice and a high priest. And this lesson we're going to discuss the sacrifice part, and in the next lesson we'll talk about the high priest part. So the famous passage that everybody turns to when talking about uh, Christ as our sacrifice, of course, is Isaiah 53. Now that's still in the Old Testament. That's not talking about something that Christ did in the New Testament. But let's look at this passage in the Old Testament and recognize that our Jewish friends feel that this is, this is a description of God talking about the Jewish nation as a whole. And I'm going to start with Isaiah 52, verse 13. <coughs> the Lord says, My servant will succeed in his task. He will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that they, he hardly looked human. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. But now many nations will marvel at him, and kings will be speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they had never known. The people reply, who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taken, taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are hauled, uh, I'm sorry, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. Now that's, those are the main verses that we're going to talk about as far as the Old Testament is concerned. And our adult uh, Sabbath School Bible study guide has this ob these observations about those verses. Jesus' death is an atonement in the form of a penal substitution. What does that mean? Yeah. What's a penal substitution? That means it's legal. It means that it's, it's uh, something that happens as a result of a punishment. It's a punishment uh, that happens because of a crime that somebody has committed. Well, in this case, it's a substitution. Somebody else has taken the place. And, of course, we're not used to thinking in those terms because it doesn't happen. I mean, how, how many of you have ever seen a, a substitution in a court case in the United States? No. Never. World War so we're not used to that. World War II once or twice. Yeah, there were a few times when this sort of thing happened in World War II. You mean when <clears throat> someone goes to prison to serve the term of someone else? Yes. Oh, but a death penalty here is Someone though. dies. Yes. Well, that's willing to die on the behalf of someone else. So, um, in fact, this, this somebody died as a substitute. Jesus died as a substitute for them. Here are some of the implications of this passage for Jesus' ministry for us. And here's, a, here's an analysis of what the passage says. One, Jesus suffered for others. He took their grief and sorrows, verse 4, 
transgressions, iniquities, verses 5, 6, 8, and 11, and sin, verse 12. He took it. Number two, he brings great benefits to those for whom he suffers, peace and healing, verse 5, and justification, verse 11. It was God's will for Jesus to suffer and be crushed, verse 10. What does that mean? Well, it, it, it says, we read earlier that we thought that God was the one that was sending the punishment, and now it, is, it was God's will. So that's one of the questions we have to struggle with. Could it be God's will, but God does not actually doing it? Uh, it was God's will for Jesus to suffer and be crushed. God put our iniquity on him. How does that happen? Because That was verse 6. Because it was God's plan that he died in our stead. Number 4. Jesus is righteous. Verse 11. I hope none of us disagree with that. Without violence or deceit. Verse 9. We would agree with that. He was a guilt offering and atoning sacrifice for sin. Verse 10. So, what do you make of all those points? Any of that sounds questionable to you? Now when you say verse 4, 5, 6, is this taken from the Bible? That's, that's Hebrews. We're talking about the, I'm, I'm sorry, Isaiah, the book, the passage Isaiah I just read from, from Isaiah 53. Okay, um, then we're taking them, are we taking them out of context, or do they pretty much well, say... Well, they're trying to, it depends on what version you use, but they're trying to actually quote the words that are taken from the, right from the Bible. Now how to interpret them, that's another story. That's what I meant. Yeah. Well, let's move on and let's get a little bit bigger context and, and, and then let's, we discuss it. I'm raising, I'm raising a couple of questions about those passages. There are several important points to consider when reading Isaiah 53. One, it should be clear in every Christian's mind that if Jesus had not come and lived and died, we would have no hope of salvation. In that very broad sense, Jesus was definitely a substitute for us. He came, he lived and died, and in that broadest possible sense, he is a substitute. Many of our Christian friends believe, and here's the part where it gets a little sticky, many of our Christian friends believe that the sufferings and death of Jesus were necessary because they were required by God. Why would that be true? God, in their thinking, was upset because man had sinned and therefore he demanded a death to pay for that sin. He had said back in the beginning, sin leads to death. He says, somebody's got to die. Jesus offered to come and live and die the perfect life without sin as a sacrificial death to meet the requirements of God and thus we can be saved. In that context, it is very interesting to read the last part of Isaiah 53, 4, which says, and I quote again, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. What's the implication of that? The implication is that he didn't, it wasn't really punishment sent by God, it's just what we mistakenly thought. Exactly. Seems like the assumption is, though, that somehow sin You've offended God and some, something demands that somebody's got to pay rather than sin doing its damage. Mm -hmm. It's sin that does the damage, not rather than God being upset and uh, having yeah. an exact a pound of flesh. Question. Yeah. Okay, taking out of context, it sounds like that, but when you read the whole chapter, it's saying almost categorically that God um, caused Jesus to die. God put the sin on him. God, God, God. Mm -hmm. That's the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, regarding what Jim just said, what is sin? We talk like sin is an entity. Sin is like big. sin caused everybody to die. But what exactly is sin? It's lawlessness. It's it, it is way it's divine. And it's, it's choosing to live out of harmony with the way things are meant to function. It, and, and here, let's, let's just be honest about that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a law of the mind that by beholding we become changed. Yes. So, you have two choices in terms of your behavior. You can choose to follow God's example, choose to follow the right that He's laid out, the plan He's laid out for us, and the Holy Spirit will come down and He will gradually mold your mind in conformity to that will. If, by, con by contrast, you choose to be rebellious, mm -hmm. and you say, no, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that, I want to do what I want to do, you know that you're doing what's wrong, 
and that's that that literally damages your brain mm -hmm. it means that you you've got things going in the wrong direction in there mm -hmm. and you're actually damaging yourself by making those kind of choices i understand that but when we say it sin does this sin does that but we have to kind of explain it a little bit that's, more mm -hmm. because yeah. and it's very difficult to try sins. to explain something when everybody's been exposed to this payment uh, mm -hmm. uh, way of looking at things they, uh, they they use the word atonement mm -hmm. as though it's a, a it's a pain rather that it's a made up word meaning to be in harmony with at one meant a state of a uh, state of harmony with the creator mm -hmm. well the way most people read isaiah 53 is very self-centered i'm sorry to say that but think follow me here real carefully it's all about how God saves you and me, and especially me. Okay. But what do their views say about God? Is God a harsh, demanding tyrant? I mean, what, what are the implications of that? I think what? a lot of them don't even think in those terms. They, they mm -hmm. don't think that far ahead. What's strange is Jesus says, when you've seen God, you've seen me. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying God wanted to punish Jesus when Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is wanting to punish himself. I mean, we, I think we need to read further to yeah. see what's going on here. And we need to think through it more carefully. Uh -huh. Well, there's, there's a couple of verses, two or three verses we need to look at to see how the New Testament authors themselves looked at the passage in Isaiah 53. So if we have an inspired apostle interpreting for us an inspired passage, that ought to be good guidance, right? Correct. So, look first at Luke 22, 37. Luke 22, 37. For I tell you that the scripture which says, now this is Jesus speaking, he shared the fate of criminals must come true about me because what was written about me is coming true. So, he shared the fate of criminals. That's one of the passages, and one of the phrases from Isaiah 53 and some translations. And so Jesus himself said, Isaiah 53 is about who? It's about me. It's, it's about, about me. About Jesus now, speaking. what is the fate of criminals? Death. Well, it should be death, basically. That's the idea, okay. yeah. Okay, now we turn to uh, Luke, Dr. Luke, Paul's companion. He writes in Acts 8, starting with verse 32, the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. And this is talking about the Ethiopian traveling back to, to Ethiopia, and Philip meets him on the way, and he, he's reading a passage that says, like a sheep that is taken to be slaughtered, like a lamb that makes no sound when its wool is cut off, he did not say a word. He was not humiliated, and justice was denied him. Was he was humiliated, thank you. No one will be able to tell about his descendants, because his life on earth has come to an end. The official asked Philip, tell me, of whom is the prophet saying this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip began to speak, starting from this passage of Scripture, he told him the good news about who? Jesus. About Jesus. So there's no question in Philip's mind what Isaiah 53 is talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And look at Peter's comments from 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you, and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no one ever heard a lie come from his lips. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross. Now we're gonna to need to talk about that a little bit, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds that you have been healed, and of course that's Isaiah 53 now. You are like a sheep that had lost their way, but now you've been brought back to follow the shepherd and keeper of your souls. Verse, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Verse 4, surely has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But that word griefs, it could be just as well be translated as sicknesses. Mm -hmm. And it, he came at a time, it, uh, it looked like one of everybody else that, that he was living among, and he came with that genetic degeneration mm -hmm. is what that really uh, is a better way to look at this thing. Okay, now we have been talking about the Old Testament sanctuary and what happened there. And we suggested that symbolically at least, the priests carried the sins around 
into the sanctuary and then out of the sanctuary. And now we have a passage that says that Jesus carried our sins. What does that mean to you? Well, that implies that you can move sins around. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it makes it much a whole lot of sense. Maybe the priest in the sanctuary carried him literally the blood or whatever, tried to pretend literally with the blood. And Jesus, uh, this is symbolic, um, our sins. But it, it says to me that Jesus is a priest. It's interesting that it goes, this is supposed to result, if you read the passage, this is supposed to result in our dying to sin and living for righteousness. Now, how does Christ dying for or carrying our sins, lead? and it goes on to say, it is by his wounds that you have been healed. If we are like sheep that have lost their way, what is required to bring us back? Wouldn't that be the question? Well, I want to say a demonstration of love, mm -hmm. but um, maybe we need to go through the lesson to try to explain what that is. Well, here's the question that very, very few people have asked, and virtually no one has tried to answer, and I'm going to bring it up. As asked by the literary character Bozo or Bozo in Anselm's Cur Deus Homo, this was written a, a, at the beginning of the 12th century. So this is 800 years ago, okay? If God could only save sinners by condemning the innocent, that would be Christ, of course, is he truly omnipotent? Because think about it now, if he can save sinners, what does the death of Christ have to do with it? I mean, why, does, why can't God just decide, okay, I'm going to save sinners without Christ dying? Wouldn't that be appropriate? If he's really omnipotent, could, can't he do that? If, on the other hand, he could, he could save sinners, but is not willing to do so, how are we to think of him as wise and just? What justice could there possibly be in accepting the death of the most innocent man who ever lived in place of the guilty? How can you call that justice? Or righteousness, for that matter. No human legal system would accept that, so how can God do such a thing? And if this legal transaction makes it possible, for God to save sinners because they are covered with the righteousness of Christ, would that suggest that we are brought into heaven without God the Father realizing that we are still sinners? Is that legal fiction? Now, we've said a lot there, but I wanted to get the whole passage in. Well, you know, it's not what do we do with that? It's not that man from antiquity that says it. I know two retired, retired cops who are not uh, Christians. They're very nice people, very clear thinking. And they are completely bothered by this God that would kill Jesus in order to pay our sins. And maybe it's because they're used to the legal system, but um, they don't want anything to do with um, a God that doesn't seem so mean. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that antiquity guy. Well, no, I'm not saying it's only him. I'm saying he's oh. one of the first ones that, that clearly the penned first? the question. Yeah. But these are tough questions, and basically Christians today don't even ask them, and they certainly aren't trying. They would have a real problem if they tried to answer it. But the non-Christians are asking. And some of them are. Yes. It, it seems like I remember from somewhere that Christ basically offered himself when he and God talked about this. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That yes. seems to be what I was raised Well, Well, and, and, and didn't have to do it. He did that before the world was created, before right. he created right. it. Actually, probably did it before he created any intelligent creatures, those in heaven. So, uh, in his foreknowledge. It even bothers me when uh, we say, uh, like, we say, who killed Jesus, or we killed Jesus, or we... We can't kill God. No. <laughs> Jesus said, I give up my life mm -hmm. and I can take it again. That's really. We didn't kill him on the cross. He gave up his life. Mm -hmm. And he just, it was a demonstration on how far we would go. I mean, we need to stop and think about what you've just said. It's really important. Do you think that if God did not want him to die, anyone could have killed him? No. No, 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 no way. Well, when he says, I lay down my life, and I take it up again. What he was saying is, you aren't even going to get the satisfaction of killing me. Yeah. I mean, he and didn't. You can't. And, John no. 10, and you can't. By definition. John 10, 18. I'm going to read the words. I'm reading from my Good News Bible again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. 
Now, th does that make him a suicide? No. I have the right to give it up. I have the authority. That's another word for right. And I have the right to take it back. That is what my father has commanded me to do. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. I don't think you'd find any place in the Gospels where Jesus explained what his death was going to do and, and uh, in the nature of a penalty or a payment. No. It's not there. But he did say why he came. Mm -hmm. He did, he, he, did, he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, I don't need to pray to the Father for you because the Father loves you himself. Everything I've learned from the Father, I've made known unto you. Uh, I've done everything you asked me to do. I've made known your character. And that's the words of Jesus. And, and then you get to Paul and Paul says, well, we're reconciled by his death, but we are saved, we're healed by his life. Study his life. Mm -hmm. This business of, of uh, well, somebody paid, that, that's a, like somebody winning the lottery. That distorts your perception of, of reality. Well, uh, and, 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 and let me disagree a little bit. There are people who, who haven't have been long in Christianity or perhaps have little education, and they, they look at this and they say, Jesus died for me, and that's what's really important to them. And nobody should try to take that away from them. I would hope Jesus they'd... did die for them. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. He did die for them. And, and, and he, they say he, that. He Jesus said, died for me. God, take, um, I give you my spirit or whatever he said at the end. And that's what he did for us. Mm -hmm. Not just us, the whole universe. Yes. His, that death experience was important. Don't, I'm, I'm not trying to admit it. I'm trying to put it into a context or a point, a way of looking at it that makes some sense. Well, here's the question that, ra that that raises. What is your understanding of what Christ has done for you personally? Is it possible that his death 2,000 years ago takes care of sins that you have not yet committed? Yes. How? How would that work? How does that work? It sounds like Tetzel selling indulgences. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a challenge, and, and people People prefer not to ask those questions, but that's why we're asking them here. We, we think people need to think about it. Question. Mm -hmm. If we don't question Abraham, supposedly God told him, take Isaac and take him up there and kill him. Mm -hmm. And he was ready to take his son and go over there and kill him. And a lot of people see that as a sort of... Uh, for uh, for, so mm -hmm. And both things seem a bit odd to me. Mm -hmm because there's nothing in the world that could make me take my son and take him somewhere and kill him. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing. And uh, if I would believe that God would ask that of me, God would say, thou shalt not kill, ask me to kill, something would be wrong with that. Now, but there's, there, you need to understand, this is, you, you, you mixed something a little bit. Now, we need to think in Jewish terms here, or, or, or in Hebrew terms. Abraham was not killing his son in his thinking. He was offering his son. So now I, I understand, see, we, we just automatically, he dies, so therefore he's killing him. But to the Jews, offering something to God is not the same as killing. They would not regard, if, if Abraham had actually killed his son, they would not call that a murder. That was an offering. So we need to, we need to understand there is that distinction in their thinking. With the same end result. Yeah, well, I mean... Y well, in, in, back at that culture, we're talking, uh, what, about 2500 uh, B.C., or 20, give or well, take? About 2000 B.C., yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that'd be right. But in that thinking, it, it, the, 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 one, the big God would ask those sort of things. So, yeah. so that, to, to him, uh, I mean, that was a culture, the Canaanite culture. Well, you know, the, the really tests have gotten bigger. If Eve only would have resisted that apple, yeah. she did not trust God and she took the apple. And so um, there's something about God has to find which people trust him. And Job had a test. Abraham had a test. Mm -hmm. We're going to get a test in the end times. And if Eve had only passed her silly little test of an apple, we wouldn't have to go through all these yep. uh, more severe tests. God has to know if you are going to be a good citizen in heaven or not. Yeah. Well, look at a couple of verses. Hebrews, we, we said we we're going to talk about Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 2, verse 9. And then we're going to go to 17. 
But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, so that through God's grace he should die for everyone. We see him now crowned with glory and honor because of the death he suffered. Okay? He died for how many? Everyone. Everyone. Look at verse 17. Same chapter, Hebrews 2, 17. Does that everyone include the angels? Well, hang on. That's a good question. This means, and I'm dropping down, same chapter, verse 17. This means that he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way. He first became like who? Angels. angels. Then he became like Humans. human beings. So he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way in order that, to be their faithful and merciful high priest in his service to God so that the people's sins would be forgiven. So he had to be like, become like us so our sins could be forgiven. How does that work? Yeah. Question. Does that mean he had a sinful nature? No. He had to become like one of us to teach. He had to get down to our uh, eyeball to eyeball le level so that he could explain things, not pay a penalty. My version puts it very nicely. He had to do this so that our sins could be forgiven. Uh, the traditional translations talk about it, propitiation. Propitiation for the sins of the people. What is a propitiation? An appeasement. An appeasement? Okay, what does that mean? To assuage the wrath of the offended deity. Okay, and that's what many people did back in, in, in his day and still do today, you know? What's going on there? So, um, Propitiation is not a word that should be used in the Bible. It's, it's a word that describes uh, someone who's trying to settle things with someone who's very angry at them and so forth, and I, I don't think it's appropriate. Pacify. Yeah, pacify. So that's a word that some translators picked out of their head as uh, uh, translating a word? Well, they believed that that's what, what needed to happen. But I mean, it, you can look at a word, and so they put their beliefs into the original word and yeah. pulled out a word that fit it, their beliefs. The original word does not say propitiation. That's their ideas. Mm -hmm. Could you explain clearly to someone who asked you why Jesus had to die? Do you understand why his death was necessary for you to be saved? Or do you believe that God could save us without Jesus having died? What are the issues in the great controversy? How do these issues impact you on a day-by-day -day basis? There's a, a lot of things going on here that we need to try to struggle with. So why do you think God chose this method of dealing with sin? I mean, we have verses for that. Look at Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin and human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. To do away with sin. What does it mean to do away with sin? I mean, we still have yeah. sin here and Jesus mm -hmm. came and... Exactly. I, I asked this question a little bit ago when I said he died 2,000 years ago and now... I'm still committing sins, and his death 2,000 years ago is supposed to take care of my sins. How does that work? Hmm. Now, to do away with sin is, is, a, is a translation. The, the, the Greek sa liter says literally, concerning sin. Oh, he came here concerning sin. Concerning Wait, sin. Are you, are you, what verse are you reading? That's the end of verse 3, Romans 8, 3. Okay, well, then you've got... You got uh, yeah, okay, but in Hebrews you got... Uh, he will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save, or you could say heal, those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Yeah. So the first time he came and lived in sin and, and, shows, uh, and uh, lived his life and demonstrated how, he, how to live, next time he's coming back to... And we need to always keep in mind one thing that many people seem to have missed, and that's this. There was no reason for him to come the first time if he doesn't plan to come back. There was no reason for him to come the first time and do everything he did at that point if he doesn't plan to come back. Did Jesus come to deal with sin to show us how to live without sin? 
I mean, well, was his life to deal with sin? And we're always looking at his death. Mm -hmm. So he came to deal with sin by an example of his life. And we maybe should look more at his life. Well, this lesson is not a great discussion about why Jesus had to die. Oh. But let me, I mean, it, 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 it's only by, sort of by implication that that's the question. Okay. Let me just say a couple words about that. It would be my understanding, and this is, this is not everybody would agree with this by any means, it would be my understanding that Jesus died of sin in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yep. And an angel had to come and revive him so that he could go out and go through the whole thing again. He died in Gethsemane before anyone had touched him. He died directly of sin. And on the cross again, after all that he went through, he died again of sin. Way, people don't die in, in three hours of crucifixion. Doesn't happen. It, it's not a reason for dying in that short period of time. But you can die from emotional crushing. People do die from their, their body just can't take the emotional burden and they just die. And what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He sweat, sweat great drops of blood. What's going on? The whole vascular system is coming unglued. You can die from that. Absolutely. And just as in a result of emotional trauma, it affected his vascular system. Yeah. Well, here's a comment from Ellen White. Were you going to? No, I was just going to mention that he died early on the cross because otherwise they would have come and broken him. Well, they did leg. that to keep him from running away yeah. because they don't, didn't die, normally wouldn't die that first day. They'd still be hanging there yeah, for Yeah, but a day they or weren't two. supposed to break his. Yeah. But the, the prophecy God said about him not breaking his bones. Mm -hmm. God said that because he knew that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. It's not of, oh, they, they can't break his bones in order they have to fulfill a prophecy. Yeah. God knew that already in advance. God knew Absolutely. that Christ was going to give up his life before they came to break the bones. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Jesus died as soon as he had said and done the things that were necessary. And when he said, Father, I, mm -hmm. into your hands I give my spirit, there was no reason for him to live anymore. And the people here on earth have done everything in the world to me. There's nothing left more that they can do. So what, have we, what do we learn from that? We learn one, sin leads to death directly. Okay, sin leads to death. It leads to separation from God and God is the source of life. Yeah, and which is what was said in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. so, uh, also in Isaiah 59 verse two. Now Ellen White comments like this. Upon, this is uh, Desire of Ages, page uh, 753. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety, notice those words, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted as a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. Would it be fair to say he was treated like a transgressor? The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, we should have a big long time to discuss what that means. The terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Desire of Ages, once again, page 753. Now, here's the question I want you to think about. Was that agony already felt in the Garden of Gethsemane? Yes. Yep. So in other words, the agony, the real agony of his death was already there in the Garden of Gethsemane before there was a crown of thorns, before there was any beating, before there was any torturing, before there was any mocking, scourging, none of those things, all those things it talks about in Isaiah 53 hadn't happened yet. So, could an angel have come and done what Jesus did no. in our place? I don't no? think so. You don't think so? Why, why not? not? Yeah, why not? Well, they're created beings like we are on a higher level. 
So what difference does that make? Well, I don't think it's the same as being the Son of God. No, it's not the same. The question is, why isn't it the same? The questions were about God, what mm -hmm. God is like, not about what God's creatures are like. Yeah. So he needed to come and live and die to tell us the truth about God. That's really what that whole thing is about. He was here to represent himself. No angel could perfectly do that. So, if we believe what Ellen White says, in last week's lesson, you may remember, we had a quotation from the book, That I May Know Him, page 338, that said, if the Father had come in place of the Son, things would have been no different whatsoever, which is completely against many people's ideas about here's the Father with the big stick up there and he's just waiting to zap anyone. Not at all. Well, you know, maybe some angels in heaven said, Jesus let us do this. They did. You're, you, you're just too... Too valuable. Too valuable to uh, do that. And Jesus says, no, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. I, w I would imagine he had a lot of volunteers that would have done it for him. So. Okay. There's a great deal of emphasis on the blood, in, particularly in the book of Hebrews. And I could give you verses, Hebrews 9, verses 12, 14, 18, 22, chapter 10, verse 19, chapter 12, verse 24, chapter 13, verse 12, 13, verse 20. I mean, it is a lot of emphasis on blood. So what does that mean to you? Why is that talked about so much? And there's an awful lot of blood in the Old Testament. Awful lot of blood That's in the Old Testament. That's where the life is, is in the blood. That's uh, Genesis... Nine. Nine, verse four, but there's another place. Where's yeah. the other one that I'm trying to think? It's there's no uh, forgiveness without blood. Okay, that's Hebrews 9, 22. Now, we should probably read that. Let, let's look at that particular verse. Cause, hold on just a second. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to you. Here's a really famous passage here. And I'm going... But it says, under the law, there was no remission for sin. Okay. Without the shedding of the blood, Let's look no at remission. that here just a second real quick. Indeed, according to the law... Now, that's the Old Testament law, the book of Hebrew, the book of books of Genesis through Deuteronomy. Almost everything is purified by blood, and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. So that, those were the rules. Yeah. In Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, so forth, that was the rules. Now, in the original word, does it mean blood, or does it mean death? The word is, the word is blood. The word is blood. Yeah. So why is there all this talk about blood? I will tell you a very interesting story. I had a lady come to me one time after she had heard me talk in a class, and she says she was so thankful that when Jesus was hanging on the cross from those wounds in his hands and his feet, there were a few drops of his blood. She didn't know how much, but at least a few drops of his blood fell on the ground, and it's those drops that fell on the ground that made it possible for him to save this earth. He could save us because there were these few drops of blood that actually landed on the ground. You think that's the case? No. Well, I could read you. I mean, if we read one of these verses, it says, Hebrew suggests that his own blood leads to our salvation. What does his own blood mean? Well, it, in, in my Bible, it actually says his sacrificial death. Oh, you mean there's a, there's a different possible meaning Footnote to this. It says his sacrificial death. Yes, in death. fact, if you look in your Bible, which I'm very familiar with, Every time it talks about blood, there'll be a little note. Every time it says that, it says, or sacrificial death. Do they have a right to do that? Or is it, is it really the blood, or is it, is it fair to put sacrificial death there? It's a symbol and what it symbolizes. Okay. Is, that, is that how they talked uh, when they said, meant sacrificial death? They would say blood? Looks like it. Yeah. And the sacrifice really began when he left heaven. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really what, it, what is mm -hmm. the, the, the beginning of that sacrifice. Well, it goes on to say that his blood purifies our consciences from useless rituals and makes the covenant effective. Blood purifies and thus leads to the possibility of forgiveness. 
Jesus' death leads to complete freedom for us to enter the most holy place. Now there's another translate, another place where it uses the name specifically, Jesus' death. Blood purifies people from sin and seals the eternal covenant. You think it's fair to call that a symbol for his sacrificial death? Isn't the communion the same sort of symbol? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But some, some other religion believe they're drinking the blood and eating the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you didn't see Jesus' disciples draining Jesus' body of his blood so that they could uh, parcel it out in little bottles and uh, pass it around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, they left his blood in his body. They were, they were running for their lives, scared to death. Uh. My Bible puts it down as purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. So, does it mean even if you had a, a couple of drops of Christ's actual blood and it could be sprinkled on you, would it accomplish that? No. What does it take to accomplish that? You need a change of mind and a change of heart. Doesn't it need, don't we need an understanding of why he came here, why he died, and all that, that teaches us about God, that changes the way we think. That changes our attitude, right? Or it could, potentially. Yes, you've got to accept it. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another comment. This is from our, the Tuesday section of our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Christ's blood does not refer to his life, but instead it is a symbol of his substitutionary death. So that sounds like your Bible, Gordon. As such, it describes the functional aspects, aspect of that death. Christ's shed blood is amazingly multifunctional. Maybe you didn't think about it like that. No. <laughs> Christ's blood obtains eternal redemption for us, provides us with cleansing from sin, provides us with forgiveness and sanctification, and is the reason for the resurrection. Now, I never have been able to understand that. What does it mean Christ's blood is the reason for the resurrection? That one's a little beyond me. Well, if he never supposedly died, he never uh, was resurrected. I don't let know. Me, let me read the rest okay. of this. This is the next paragraph. In Hebrews, there is a powerful contrast. Christ's blood is better than any other blood. Do you think it was really different than any other blood? In fact, no other blood can really provide forgiveness. Christ's death is the only reason sins are forgiven, before and after the cross. Now here, see it just automatically shifts from blood to death. So clearly they're, they're, they're associating those two. We guess we need to make that point. Does that verse answer the, uh, the prior question? The Hebrews 9.15? Uh -huh, about our sin after the cross? Well, this is what the verse says. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while the first covenant was in force. So now you can see, do you agree with their interpretation of that? Let me, let me finish the passage. The shedding of Christ's blood and its effects are clear evidence that Christ's death was substitutionary which means that he took the penalty that we deserve. Maybe uh -huh. he showed us the penalty that we deserve. Yeah. And that would, that, I mean, you would think that we, it would make a difference. If we look at Christ's life, we think about what happened in Gethsemane, if we really understand it, and we see right there, we see sin killing Jesus. That ought, to, that ought to do something to us, shouldn't it? The penalty that we deserve, but we are, we are all going to die. We're going to get that penalty. Well, we're going to die the first death. We're not going to die the second death. And that's another question, because which death did he die? He didn't die of a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. He died of sin. And that's what he said was, was true back in Genesis 2. Uh, these paragraphs from the Bible study guide are talking about one model mm -hmm. of why Jesus died, the mm -hmm. substitutionary model. Mm -hmm. And there are clearly other models mm -hmm. 
that you and I both think may fit better. Mm -hmm. So what is your understanding of what the blood of Christ has done for you? Let me read some verses. Exodus 12, verse 5. Now we're going back to the Old Testament pattern. You may choose either a sheep or a goat, but it must be a one-year-old male without any defects. Okay, This is your sin offering, okay, without any defects. Look at Leviticus 3.1. When anyone offers one of his cattle as a fellowship offering, it is to be a bull or cow without any defects. Okay? And one more place, look at uh, chapter Leviticus 4, verse 3. If it is the high priest who sins and so brings guilt on the people, he shall present a young bull without any defects and sacrifice it to the Lord for his sin. So there's a very clear emphasis on it has to be a perfect sacrifice without any defects. Why is that important? Because our I mean, does it matter if the the lamb has a little scratch on his leg? The lamb is supposed to represent Jesus, so um, they had to make the uh, model clear to the people. It had to be perfect. Okay. And the Messiah, when he came, would be perfect. Why was it necessary for Jesus to live a sinless, perfect, sinless life? That's Couldn't his nature. Okay. That's God. Okay. I think there's, there's a part of that that's even sort of goes a little beyond that. Remember that Satan had said, no human being can come down here and live on this earth a sinless life. He made that claim against Job, didn't he? A couple of times. Nobody can live. Nobody. None of these, these human beings here, you think they can live a sinless life? You think anybody as a human being can live a sinless life? And Jesus said, yeah, it's possible. And he did. So what was the purpose of that? To refute Satan's arguments. Well, and also when Jesus went back to the Father, he was able to send us the Comforter. And through the Comforter, the Comforter is constantly making us like Jesus and taking sin out of our lives. So Jesus not only lived a sinless life, but through the Comforter, he helped um, us be able to live yeah. a sin sinless life. Well, here's a suggestion from Ellen White. This is from a relatively uh, uh, unusual source called the Paul Paulson Letters. Paulson was a uh, church, one of the church leaders that Ellen White wrote a lot of letters to. And these are words on, from one of those letters. By comparing their lives with Christ's characters, talking about church members, they will be able to discern where they have failed to meet the requirements of God's holy law and will seek to make themselves perfect in their sphere even as God is perfect in his sphere. So who is supposed to be our, our example? Jesus and yeah. his comforter is supposed to be our helper. Yes, to do that. Yeah. Well, look at Jude 24. To him was able to keep you from falling and to bring you faultless and joyful before his glorious presence. The lambs are supposed to be what? Faultless, weren't they? So God says, now he recognizes that we've sinned a lot, but as you suggested, he said the Holy Spirit can make us once again faultless. Um, there's another couple of passages we need to look at in this section. Look at Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. Now my version will make this sound a little easier, easily easier to understand. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's light, they tasted heaven's gift, and received their share of the Holy Spirit, they knew from experience that God's word is good, and they have felt the powers of the coming age, and then they abandon their faith. It is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing him to public shame. Okay? It's impossible to bring them back if they once been truly Christian and, and given it up. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> 
Well, let me read you one other one. This is chapter 10, Hebrews 10, starting with verse 26. For there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sins if we purposely go on sinning after the truth has been made known to us. Instead, all that is left is to wait in fear for the coming judgment and the fierce fire which will destroy those who oppose God. Anyone who disobeys the law of Moses is put to death without any mercy when judged guilty on the evidence of two more witnesses. What then of those who despise the Son of God, who treat as a chief thing, cheap thing the blood of God's covenant which purified them from sin, who insult the Spirit of grace? Just think how much worse is the punishment they will deserve. For we know who said, I will take revenge, I will repay, and who also said, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I can tell you that Martin Luther read those two passages that we just read. And he struggled with them, he struggled with them, and he said, this book of Hebrews can't be, doesn't belong in my New Testament. And he took the it along with James, Second Peter, Jude, and Revelation. He didn't know for sure what to do with those either. He didn't believe they taught the gospel that he believed in, and he put them in an appendix at the end of the New Testament. And, you know. That doesn't uh, fit with Paul, because no. Paul says a lot of times, the good I want to do, I don't do, and this and that. But he, al he also believed that, you know, he has his grace all over him. Well, so how do we, how should we understand those two passages? I think it's saying, if we persistently refuse God, he will sadly let us go. This he, is the same says, thing as Romans 1 says in yeah, several places, you're a, Hosea 11 yeah. and several He says places. you go on crucifying again the Son of God if you persist in your sin. Well, yeah, if you absolutely insist on hanging on to your sin, God will have to finally say, I'm sorry. This doesn't mean if you once sin after you've been a Christian, you're hopeless. So. I think this is where Martin Luther missed it. Well, hanging on to your sin. Sometimes your sin hangs on to you. Like <laughs> always trying to... You notice that too? Yeah. Always trying to give up alcohol or give up smoking or, or gambling or something, and you're trying and trying. Maybe eventually you'll get there, but um, you, you can't just be told once, Oh, by the way, stop gambling. Yeah. And boom, you know, and oh, do this, and boom, you're there. So um, yeah. I think as long as you're trying. If we truly fixed our eyes upon Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, and really sought to become more and more like him, giving the Holy Spirit access to our minds so we could be changed, what would happen? We would be changed. We would be changed. Ellen White used, spoke these words at the beginning of her book on Desire of Ages, page 25. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which he had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed, and now we're back to Isaiah 53, verse 5, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, how do you see that? Do you have any questions about that? Well, one more passage from Desire of Ages, page 660. Nothing less than the death of Christ could make his love efficacious for us. What does efficacious mean? Effective. Okay. It is only because of his death that we can look with joy to his second coming. And his, his sacrifice is the center of our hope. Upon this we must fix our faith. So she clearly felt that something really happened on that cross and in the Garden of Gethsemane and so forth that's supposed to really impact us. And I think that the answer is it's because of what was happening there, because of the, the meaning of it, because of the way it answered Satan's questions, the way the, because of the way it, it, it confirmed the truth about God that we can, we can say, hooray, I like that, I want to be like that. Self-centered sinners can look at the passages we have been given to read in this lesson and thank God that all has been done to save us, especially me. Does that sound a little bit selfish? How often do we think about what our lives and our beliefs say about God? The great controversy is not about us 
Everyone knows that we are sinners. And you remember Romans 3.23. The great controversy is about how God answers the misrepresentations, the accusations, and the questions that Satan has raised about God's character and government. Are we living lives that correct, correctly represent God and the great controversy? You, you remember mean, Zechariah, th go ahead. You mean when we say we're God's children, we're supposed to act like God's children? Yeah, how about that? <clears throat> remember Zechariah 3, 1 to 5? Why is it that this passage, no sacrifice was made on Joshua's behalf? God just said, take his filthy clothes away. And there was no lamb offered, there was no bull offered, no goat offered. Does that mean that this passage from the Old Testament is misrepresenting the truth? Many people read Isaiah 53 as one of the most precious, pa precious passages in the whole Bible, especially verses 4 to 6. Do you believe that's the best possible description of the role of our Savior in this world? Or is there something more? What does this lesson say to us about the involvement of the entire universe in the plan of salvation? Ellen White says a lot about that. Where's that in this passage? Well, in the latter part of the book of Isaiah, there are five songs, they're called songs, talking about a servant of the Lord. These are sometimes called the songs of the suffering servant. Found Isaiah 42, 1 to 9, 49, 1 to 7, 50, 1, uh, 4 through 9, 52, 13, through 53, 12, and 61, 1 to 3. Why do you suppose God, uh, Isaiah was given these messages? Are they clearly describing the substitutionary sacrifice that we've been talking about? And what does it mean God has laid upon him the iniquities of us all? And then it goes to say, but it will justify many. All of the iniquities are laid on him, but it justifies many? What happened there? What's the difference between the all and the many? Only those who appreciate it does it uh, affect. Only those who take advantage of it, learn the truth. Only those people who say, yes, I believe that. I, I'm thankful for what God has done for me. Well, in this lesson, we have compared a number of different passages in Hebrews with these very significant passages in Isaiah 42 through 61. And obviously, we didn't have time to read all of those but especially Isaiah 53. Is it more important to you that Jesus died on this earth as a substitutionary sacrifice for you, for me, or that God has answered all the questions in the great controversy that have been raised by Satan thus and thus defeated him completely? Is the whole universe involved in this controversy? And if so, what did they learn from the life and the death? Of Jesus. I am absolutely convinced that the questions that were abroad in the universe had to be answered by that life and death, and that's what makes it efficacious. What do you think? See you next week.